as a small business owner, you deserve more. More confidence, more connectivity, more of the tools that help your business thrive. And at Cox Business, you can expect more from us. We don't just have sales reps. We have perfect plan identifiers. People who will work with you to make sure your business gets everything it needs and nothing that it doesn't. Your business deserves more, and that's why you can expect more from Cox Business. Call 800-526-8572 to switch today. Prepare for glory! I don't know if you got your pop on ready. Do you got your pop on ready? I came out the wrong line already. And he's hit the end zone for an unbelievable touchdown. I would be honored if you played football for this team. Throw it up above his head. They can't jump the me. Golly! Only tackle him at the point of line. Who can make a play? I can. Who can make a play? I can. <laughs> What's going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Football Roundtable Podcast, proud members of the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. You can find them at FTF Podnet on Twitter. You can find me at SportsFanaticMB on Twitter. And you can find my co-host for the day, Mr. Matthew Fox, at Nighthawk7734 on Twitter, and Tony Dyer at CommissionerMR on Twitter. We are running a great podcast here today, again, the Fantasy Football Roundtable, and we are just one of a ton of great podcasts that are uh, associated with this network. Some of those are Jim Day of FF Champs, Adam Ronis and Dr. Roto from Sirius XM Radio, Bob Lung of the award-winning Fantasy Football Consistency Guide, Dwayne McFarlane, Blake Sullivan, and a ton of great others. You can find all of our great podcasts on FullTimeFantasy.com, your one-stop shop for all of your fantasy news, advice, and strategies. On top of that, we at the Fantasy Football Roundtable are excited to be partnered with Expand the Box Score. You can find them at expandtheboxscore.com. Go there, use the code ROUNDTABLE to get 10% off. They have some of the best stats in the industry. I'm telling you guys, if you're one of those people like me who likes to go in and look at different stats from everything from catch rate to target ratio to, to uh, my goodness, what is it, breakout percentages, everything. It's ridiculous. Dominator ratings. Everything on college football, baseball, NFL, and they're about to bring basketball in as well for those of you who play fantasy basketball. It is a great side. I use it, and it's just $15 for an entire year. And again, you get 10% off when you use our code ROUNDTABLE. Just check it out. I'm telling you, you will love it. I use it if you follow me on Twitter and you see all the stuff I put out on the college football stuff and all these players' stats and ratings and everything you see me put out there. It is all coming from that one site again. Just $15, and you use our code ROUNDTABLE, you will get 10% off of that, and that's a full year subscription right there. So it is well worth your time and money. With both of those being talked about, again, check out FullTimeFantasy.com and ExpandTheBoxScore.com. For today's podcast, we are going to be doing a little bit of everything like we do every Thursday. Honestly, kind of one of my favorite episodes of the week. Don't really have a, a, a main show agenda here as we just kind of dive into a bunch of different stuff. We're going to talk about the Broncos game that uh, is going to happen tonight between the Broncos and the Chiefs, a really good matchup. Tony, who is a big Colts fan, we're going to get his opinion on what the Colts and Texans have to do or what the Colts have to do to beat the Texans this week in a huge AFC South matchup. My goodness, guys, I want to say a mouth matchup. The AFC South matchup for first place right now very early on in the season. And then we're going to talk something to a little bit about running backs and draft strategies. There's been a lot of talk here lately with the way that a lot of NFL teams are moving toward two backfields or two, two players in the backfield, two running backs, how we might be changing our draft strategies moving forward or how fantasy might change. Uh, there used to be a thing called the third round reversal, which will discuss later or possibly moving toward a team RB thing for fantasy and then after that we're going to talk about some of our bounce back candidates for the second half as we're getting pretty close really that's starting this week or next week depending on how long your fantasy season goes our bounce back candidates and candidates and our fall off candidates for the first and second half And as I mentioned right there in the intro, we've got Tony and Matt back with us for another great Thursday episode. Matt, Tony, how you guys doing today? How has your week been so far? It's been going pretty good. Uh, just uh, cruising along, looking forward to the game tonight. Yeah, been a good day. I was just telling everybody off the air. I felt I held everybody up today. I fell asleep on the couch. I'm just, I'm kind of feel like I'm waking up right now. 
So, sorry about that. But outside of my nap, everything else has been great this week. Um, really nothing new to report. I hear you. I might actually take it. It's a good thing, though, because I might actually take a nap after this is over so I can stay up tonight because I'm actually really excited about this Thursday night game. I know, Matt, you obviously are probably extremely excited yep. about that with it being the Broncos and the Chiefs and the Broncos being your team. So let's jump right in and get your thoughts on, on the Thursday night game between the Broncos and the Chiefs. We eating all day, bro. <laughs> You every time, every time you come as well, I'm gonna hit you. I'm not gonna be able to do that. You don't want no problems, bro. You are my boy. I'm a man. I'm about to get ugly. I want to score. Yeah. You don't want to talk so much. It's time to do it now. Not just a good old fashioned rear end whipping. To the house, baby. I'm in a league of my own. Baby, rest with me. Are you tired? Are you tired? Let's go. No problem. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really excited. You know, it's it's amazing how quickly things shift uh, in the NFL. If you would have talked to me about playing this game three weeks ago, I would have had a different mindset. You know, the Broncos had just dropped 0 and 4. They looked like they had no idea what they were doing. Uh, there's a lot of frustration and consternation here, and the Chiefs just look like the super team, 4 and 0, just rolling along right where they picked up. And the last two weeks, Denver. You know, Vic Fangio made a couple of adjustments, put in Alexander Johnson as a starter, Mike Purcell as a starter, uh, and that has made a world of difference to our defense up front and especially against the run. Um, and, you know, offense seemingly figuring it out. We're getting a little better luck, getting turnovers, getting people healthy. And meanwhile, the Chiefs getting less healthy and, you know, really a, seems like people have kind of figured out a formula. It's, you know, not always exciting fantasy wise to watch, but both the Colts and the Texans kind of able to grind it out and hold them in check. And then you're coming into a short week. Patrick Mahomes, everybody saw him get tagged on his ankle last week. His starting left tackle and left guard have already been declared out. Their best pass rusher has been declared out and Watkins has been declared out. And they're coming on a short week to mile high. Uh, I am pretty pumped. Um, if you've seen our Fantasy Life app blog picks, I think I was the only one that picked Denver. I actually think uh, we're going to do it tonight. Well, see that. So that's the interesting thing. I was torn all morning when I was getting ready to send you my picks because I was like, I really want to pick the Broncos. It's so hard to go against Patrick Mahomes. But now that you say all that, how long do I have to change my pick? I mean, I know you put it in the in the article, but I can still change it, right? I can still go back and be like, it, I'm going to take the Broncos. I guess you could. It just published. Well, you know, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't want to go against the published article. I don't know. I'm still torn on it. I really do think they have a big shot at winning tonight. You mentioned that they have obviously gotten beat the past two weeks by more of like a time of possession and their running game. So with that being said, are you expecting big nights tonight from Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman or just one or the other? Um, I think, I think both, you know, we've seen both be usable. I think Lindsay's the big play guy and he's the one that seems to be getting more of the goal line carries. So I would put him out in front, but I think they're both, uh, both going to be, uh, pretty good and pretty involved. The the Chiefs uh, do not have a great defense. Um, they'd probably be one of the lesser defenses that we've played against uh, in the last few weeks. Um, Emmanuel Sanders was banged up. You know, he went out in the second quarter last week with a knee injury and didn't return. He's supposed to play tonight, um, but I thought after he went out uh, and all the coverages kind of rolled to Sutton that they leaned more heavily on running the ball last week and dumping the ball off to running backs. Um, and I, I think we're going to do that again. Mike Munchak has done some very good work. You know, we, if you watched Denver week two against Chicago, uh, Garrett Bowles got four called holding penalties, probably could have had like a dozen if they hadn't <laughs> declined a bunch of them. And since then, you know, I have not heard his name called in these games in a good way. Like he, he seems to have cleaned it up. The line in general seems to be playing better, giving Flacco a little bit more time. They seem to be running the ball better. They got Andy Janovich, their fullback, back. I think all those things shape up uh, to be, you know, Denver is a team that definitely, if you said the way to beat the Chiefs is to run and hold the ball and to play really tight defense and pressure the quarterback, they actually have the players and the desire to play that kind of football. 
they've played the Chiefs close in Denver the last few years, uh, even when they, they've struggled as a team. And I just feel like there's a lot of momentum right now. And we're catching Kansas City at a good time. Yeah, I think last year wasn't uh, that was the first game where they really looked like they could actually lose it, wasn't it? Was against Denver and then Kansas City ended up pulling it out late. Yeah, De- that was a really heartbreaking loss because I thought Denver had won uh, that game last year and they kind of lost it. So you know, I it definitely could happen, uh, but I just feel like there's a lot of momentum and everybody seems to be counting Denver out. I haven't seen a lot of. Um, picks going their way and i know they're not they're not favored they're home underdogs by yeah. quite a quite a bit i think tonight and i just i think things are shaping up especially you know kansas city lost their veteran center in, during the off season, and now you're coming into this game without the entire starting left side of your offensive line that's a pretty big deal uh you know we still have von miller out there for denver so you know, I that would be reason to be nervous. And they don't have a very uh, strong running game. You know, I was doing the preview today. I think you still have to start Tyree Kill and Kelsey and Mahomes um, because of who they are, because of where you drafted them. But I, I wouldn't feel confident starting a single Chiefs running back. We talked last week. They're split in time. Nobody seems to be able to establish themselves. And now they're going behind a patchwork offensive line. You know, I think those are all things that – that don't bode well for Kansas City. Yeah, absolutely. What uh, what do you think Emmanuel Sanders might do tonight? Is he is he playing for sure? Um, he was back at practice. The last few tweets I saw said he, it looked like he was going to be a go. I guess we won't know until they do official actives and inactives. I expect that he's going to play. Um, I would not be high on it, expectations for him. What um if Sanders doesn't go, a guy that I've I've loved on this Broncos offense, I thought had a pretty good back half of the year last year, uh when everybody expected Cortland Sutton to step up uh once Demarius Thomas was traded, in my opinion it was actually Deshaun Hamilton. Do you think he has a chance to do anything tonight? No. Uh okay. you know, I, I was relying on him hopes. coming into the season and excited, but he had the entire second half where he was playing opposite Sutton. Last week, I think he got two targets and two catches. Uh, he just, uh, you know, I guess has not developed the chemistry with Flacco or hasn't come on. You know, when they lost Sanders last week, it seemed like they really focused on trying to run the ball more and pass to running backs more. Uh, and they're rotating tight ends, peppering those guys in. They they tried putting Fred Brown in to give a little lift to the defense, you know, to challenge them deep. So I just, I don't, you know, I, I think it's hard for this offense with Joe Flacco to sustain two really strong fantasy right. passing targets. We've only seen it in one out of six games, a game where they were behind for a while and just started throwing and throwing and throwing and had a couple of big plays for both Sutton and Sanders. I just, you know, Deshaun Hamilton would be the ultimate desperation play. And on a Thursday night against the Chiefs, I don't. I would trust you have some better desperation plays on Sunday if it comes to that. Well, if Sanders is out, I, I think Hamilton might score tonight. I'm not saying playing him, but I, I think Hamilton has a sneaky good game. I think the, the Colts are going to do everything they can to stop Sutton. Not that they can, but I think they are going to kind of lean all into that. So, obviously, you're you're picking the Broncos. Uh, Tony, where do you fall on this game? How do you think this game is going to go tonight? Well, I agree with um... – with almost everything Matt said, but I want to give you a, a pat on the bat here, Matt. Um, Vegas does not have this game heavily favored in one direction. The Chiefs are losing three points on the line. So Denver, you know what I mean? Uh, three points is pretty normal. Yeah, it's like I a guess. home field advantage. Yeah, right no, I mean, yeah. So it's really probably a six-point spread, and then it's at, so they're getting three points extra. It's really a pretty close game, I think. I'm excited about the game. I'm excited that Kansas City looks beatable. Um, what's really exciting is that Kansas City two weeks in a row has been beaten. We all know that, but looking at the way they lost, they've lost two different ways. They lost, um, they lost defensively against Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago. And then last week they were outshot by Houston. So yeah, I think this game could go any way. I'm a little bit worried about Joe Flacco being able to keep up enough energy to put enough points up, but the defense is 
is good enough. They've allowed, I think Broncos have allowed less than 100 points against them all year. So I don't know. This could be another one of those fun matchups. And although I'm, I'm, if I'm putting money on, on the game, I'm putting money on the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. But it's not one of those games that I, it's, if we wake up in the morning and the Broncos win by a field goal, nobody's going to be like, well, where did this happen? What, you know, what happened? Where did this come from? Right. I think it's a winnable game. It's going to be a fun game. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, I, I think it is too. Uh, do you, either one of you expect it to be a high scoring contest or you expect it more to be, uh, like a, cause, uh, the, the Texans Chiefs wasn't that bad last week. I would, so we, we expecting something in the twenties. You expect them to get them to the thirties. If it's a high scoring contest, I think the Broncos will not be able to keep up. So I think it's going to be yeah. a defensive game. It's going to be a run game. Um, I think that the Denver will probably, this game's going to look a lot more like the Indianapolis game than the Houston game. Yeah, teens or low 20s is where um, I would put it. All right. Well, Tony, let's get into your favorite team's matchup this week. In the AFC South, you have a battle for really first place right now between the Houston Texans and your Indianapolis Colts. How do you see that one going against? uh, Me and Matt talked about this on Monday or Tuesday's podcast. I think... Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson are probably the lead candidates right now. We'll probably see him see as the NFL MVP. So going up against a guy who's been red hot and the Indianapolis Colts coming off a bye, what is your expectations for this game? And this is, this is a game. I, I feel a lot like, um, a lot like Matt probably feels right now with his game tonight. I think it's a winnable game, but I'm really on the edge of my seat figuring, trying to figure out what's going to happen here. I'm excited about having a bye week to plan. I'm excited about Darius Leonard coming back to the field. The defense is getting healthier. Um, Marlon Max had a week to rest up. I, this is it's. It, I almost going to say the same thing that I said about the uh, Denver Kansas City game. This is hopefully for Indianapolis. It's going to end up being a defensive grind. If that's the case, I think Indianapolis wins. But yeah, I mean, Deshaun Watson's thrown for like. 1,400 yards or 1,600 yards. I mean, 1,644 yards already. This is He's playing with his hair on fire. Um, it's, it's a real similar situation for me where I think it is a winnable game, but gosh, I don't even – I should have been more prepared for this. It's a really emotional <laughs> thing when it's your home team. You know, I don't want to oh, get yeah. caught up in, in being too much of a fan. Oh, that's all right. It's winnable. Yeah, you know what I mean? It is winnable. I think that DeAndre Hopkins has been disappointing, and that can continue. I think that Will Fuller is – that's the problem is you are talking about DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller here. Yeah. Will Fuller goes off for 150 yards and two touchdowns, and the game is over. That's just all there is to it. So there's so many explosive parts of the Houston team that have to be kept under control. It's going to come down to the defense yet again um, because Jacoby Jacoby's done a good job controlling the ball, getting first downs. but the the deep ball doesn't happen the same as it does in Houston. So it's another one of those games where as a as a Colts fan I'm excited, but as an NFL fan, I'm kind of staying away from this game as far as betting purposes go because it could just go so many different directions so fast. Uh I I don't know. That's what I'm trying to say is I, there's so much on the line here that I don't know what's going to happen. Matt, what about you? What are your thoughts about this Indianapolis Colts and Texans matchup? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a couple of games on, uh, this, uh, this weekend schedule that I think are these battles for first place that are going to be really fascinating. I'm really excited to see, uh, the Cowboys and the Eagles on Sunday night, but I think during the day, this might be, uh, one of the best games because both the Colts and the Texans have been playing really well. Both have had, uh, games that, you know, are a little bit of head scratchers, uh, that, you know, that, that they dropped. Um, but I think, you know, we saw both teams, how often do you have both teams coming into a battle for first place where they both coming off wins against the same team in their last time they played. I thought that was kind of funny, but I'm excited to see what, what Watson's going to do against this Colts team and what Brissett and Marlon Mack are going to be able to do against the Texans. You know, both of them have some similar strengths and some, uh, and a lot on line. And we thought, this Colts team, you know, when we thought we were going to have Andrew Luck, they were a real trendy pick. I 
I had thought they were a real Super Bowl contender. And I think there was almost a tendency to overreact a little bit too much from some of us, not you, Matt, but from some others that when they switched to Brissett, that it kind of took them out. I think we're seeing they still have that core of a great team. Frank Reich has done some great things with them. Um, and the Texans have a really talented core, too. I think this is going to be a fun back and forth game. And it's one that feels really hard to pick. Yeah, that, that early window, I think it's just them and then the, the Vikings and Lions game are the only two that I think are going to be interesting games. I think all the rest of them and just looking at them, I mean, I guess the Cardinals and Giants could be interesting, but for me, it doesn't have any real ramifications like those other two games do. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to be keyed all in with the Browns not playing this weekend. Those are the two games I'm going to be flipping back and forth to a lot, uh, in that early window. I mean, I picked the Colts to win this one. I, I like the Colts in this. I, I don't know why, but I've just been really high on Jacoby Brissett. I mean, I know I've talked about it with both of you guys. I I, I bought all into him on a, in a bunch of leagues this year before the Andrew Luck thing happened because I knew he'd be a free agent. I thought he'd get a shot at being a starter somewhere. Uh, so that's that was one of the reasons why, as you mentioned, I was not that down on the Colts when when the when the move happened because I agree. I think their their offense all around has a ton of great pieces. I love the Paris Campbell. Uh, uh, draft pick. Now, obviously, that hasn't quite worked out so far this year. He's been dealing with injuries, but that defense is loaded. I, I don't think people realize how... Well, I, I would imagine if you're in an IDP league, you know how good Darius Leonard was last year, but that dude was a beast. I think he kind of got robbed uh, for defensive MVP, and I actually don't even think he won Rookie of the Year. So, I mean, it's just a... That whole team has been very well built uh, the past couple years, so I, I'm big, big fan of the Colts. I still pick them to win this division. I mean, the the Laramie Tunsil thing I thought might change that a little bit for the Texans and give them the edge, but I'm still riding the Colts. I think it's going to be a good game. Love it. <laughs> All right, with all that being said, I wanted to discuss a little bit of a topic with you guys here. Me and Matt kind of touched on it the other day with so many running backs um, on teams kind of moving toward two-man backfields. So a long time ago, and I, I shouldn't say a long time ago, but – it was me. We were talking about this before the show, obviously. And Matt had said that he had never heard of this. I don't. I don't know if Tony, if you had. I'd only really heard about. I'd only done it in one league. It was a thing called the third round reversal, and it was put in effect because of back when Latani, L- Latanian. My God, I was trying to compare or er, combine his first and last name. Ladanian Tomlinson was just blowing up and was by far the best running back in the league every single year. It was a way to not give that first pick because he was always going one one, an extra advantage by having him. So when the third round came back around it flipped the draft order so they had to wait even longer to pick again my question is do you guys think that that would help because i've noticed and i would love to get your guys thoughts i don't know how many redrafts you guys are in but i've noticed a lot of the redrafts that i'm in the teams that have cmc well not really barkley this year but the cmc's the zeke's um who am i forgetting right now off the top of my head geez there's someone else who's up there well come on see Maybe my point was not going to be well here because Kamara's kind of struggled too. But those top five backs have a clear advantage over everybody else where you see all these other running backs moving into a timeshare. Do you think that the third round reversal could help kind of set that off or help the teams that are not getting these high end running backs where it really seems to only be a few that are the workhorses and the only guys are getting all the work compared to two teams? Or do you think we could move toward a team RB thing for fantasy moving forward like hey you draft the Browns and then I was listening to someone talk about this the other day they're in a league where they do that it's team RB and he had the Chiefs RBs well he won his matchup last week because the Chiefs RB to get all together with all three of them scored 56 points last week so he won because he had the Chiefs running backs and it was just it's all of the running backs so no matter what points are put up in a running back thing or all of their running backs that uh once they put the points up that's what happens, that, that you get all those points. So what are your guys' thoughts on those? Do you think that might change, especially if we start seeing more and more teams moving toward a dual backfield, or you think it's just going to have to be a, you're just going to have to draft multiple backs and, and hope for the best kind of thing? Sure, I'll jump in on this one. Um, yeah, I had never really heard of this draft strategy either, or the, the draft style, I guess, um, until you had brought it up. I've got... The majority of my leagues are redraft leagues. I've got one. It's not the same, but every two rounds, the order switches. We have to we literally put cards on a table and you pull a card out every every two rounds. So you wow. might draft a third third draft slot for two rounds, then fifth, and then eighth, and then third again. I mean, it's it's crazy to keep up with. 
it doesn't quite it's not to do the same thing it's not for the same purpose right. but it kind of accomplishes the same result sometimes um but the long story short i don't think that that's necessary we've got dalvin cook is somebody i wanted to, to throw out there when you were naming some of these top running backs dalvin cook's a perfect example of a running back that wasn't drafted for the most part as a top five or six option who's performing that way um and it, Dalvin Cook's one of those players that we know has the talent and the opportunity, but nobody was forecasting that. I wasn't forecasting Dalvin Cook to be a top five running back this year. So when I look at when I look at the number of quality workhorses that do still exist, and then I look at a team like um, like Matt's Denver Broncos, there's really two two different running backs there. Um, yeah, they. I don't know. Is that a committee or is that just a split backfield? I don't know. I feel like there's value in both of those picks. And no, I, the, the long story short is no. I don't think a third round reversal is necessary. Uh, I understand the point, but there's still enough teams with workhorse features that that's really not not necessary. You've got a round or two worth of workhorses. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if you were really talking about bringing back something like that third round reversal, I think this year would be the worst possible case for you making that argument because the consensus top three picks at the time of drafts and even most redrafts were Barkley, who had two iffy games and has been out injured, McCaffrey, who's been incredible, and Kamara, who's just been okay. Uh, you know, and then you talk about Ezekiel Elliott. He, he he varied in drafts because no one was quite sure when he was going to come back. And I think he's been fine, but he hasn't been incredible. Uh, you know, I play in a, I'm in about five redraft leagues, I think. And in most of the leagues where somebody went uh, Barkley with their high pick, they're not even in the playoff hunt right now uh, because of other draft picks. The real value and the real booms we had in this draft were people like Dalvin Cook, who you got later, who really exploded or somebody like Chris Godwin, who you were picking up in the middle rounds or Darren Waller, who you picked up for free. I think fantasy football for a few years has been like that. I talked about last year, the fantasy MVP to me was Philip Lindsay, the guy nobody drafted that ended up being a top 10 running back. Whoa, 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 whoa. I drafted off the wire. I drafted him. Just saying. Well, I drafted, (laughs) I drafted sub two. It depends on when you drafted, but you know, when we see you forget when we started last season, most people thought it was going to be Devonte Booker and then a little bit of Royce Freeman. And it was in the first game. Lindsay had some explosive plays and then he was off to the races. Those are the, those are where you really end up finding your value and picking it up. I would not want to play in any league that was doing a third round reversal. I, you know, drafting is important, but drafting is only one component of being successful in fantasy football and playing team QB and and team running back, I mean, it kind of sucks some of the fun out of keeping up with things, making a waiver wire pick, going with your gut, putting together those teams that are going to compete. You know, a lot of, you know, you said you drafted Lindsay last year. I drafted him a couple of leagues, too, because I had a feeling that there was going to be great value in there. If you're doing things like this to, like, compensate because people are woe-begotten if they didn't get a top three pick – you're kind of eliminating those aspects or minimizing those aspects. I think it's just a realization now that the game has changed. There's four or five uh, running backs that are going to provide incredible value. And then there's a lot of teams where there's two or three running backs that are going to provide you solid value. And I think we have to change our conception of what is somebody who's in an RB2 range or in a flex range or even a low end RB1 range. You know, we need to change, moderate expectations, just kind of like, you know, fantasy football has to evolve just like football has evolved. We aren't seeing 32 teams lining up with an eye back 70% of the time anymore. You're seeing three receivers. You're seeing a nickel defense almost all the time. I mean, the game has changed, so it makes sense that our game would change as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to... uh... I don't want to toot my own horn here, but yeah, I was very, I loved Philip Lindsay. I know you know, cause we've had many discussions about this as I have with, with Dennis, who's my co-host over on Fridays. Like I had talked about him before the draft process. I was extremely disappointed when, when he went undrafted. Cause I honestly thought he wasn't going to get a shot anywhere. I wrote an article, uh, for QBList.com back in 
August, I want to say it was right before the first preseason game, where I said when he got on there, if he wasn't just a kick returner, because I think at that point he had just been named the kick returner, I was like, if they actually used him, I thought that kid would be fantastic. And I, I give all the credit to my brother because he went to Colorado State, and I went up to uh, Colorado and watched a game with him one time, and that was the game that he came in and destroyed Colorado State. And I was like, oh, my God, this kid is amazing. Uh, I, I've loved Philip Lindsay ever since. I, I hate that I traded him. I know we talked to uh, – me and you talked about it. I I got um I don't even remember. It was I actually got Jacoby Brissett, so that's funny how that kind of all intertwines there with with you and Tony both being here. I had to give up Lindsey and Freeman to get Jacoby Brissett because I needed another quarterback. And ever since I traded him, he's just been going off every week, and it hurts my heart that I had to give away my boy <laughs> like that because I love Philip Lindsey. Um, so okay, well, with, with all that being said, so I do agree with both of you and what you're saying that uh. You know, I guess if you really were to look at this year, it's just been CMC. So everybody who had the one two is just loving life right now because you know, I would say probably 99% of people went Barkley at one. So you likely got CMC at two. I know in actually two of my redraft leagues, the person at three got CMC because Alvin Kamara went two, which I would never take Alvin Kamara over CMC, but maybe that's just me. What are your guys' thoughts then on, on, on this kind of moving forward? Are you guys, I just want a general draft strategy from you guys. Do you guys tend to go RB heavy, uh, in your drafts just based on, I feel like the, the position is just extremely volatile. I mean, the wide receivers seem like it's extremely deep. I know I'll just give you guys mine real quick. QB and tight end, I wait forever on. I don't ever mess with them in drafts. I mean, Matt, you, you're in the FLA draft with me. I think this is the first time I ever reached for a quarterback, and that's just because I wanted Baker, and that has completely not worked out for me. So that's exactly why I don't reach for quarterbacks. But in almost every draft I've been in, I've gotten Mark Andrews, and I got him late. I got him in like rounds 9 to 11. So where, what do you guys generally tend to do with running backs for you guys when you do your drafts? I think I tend to just see um, what's available. I don't press. You know, I think it depends for me somewhat where you end up uh, in draft position. Because if you're at the back of the first round, I think it makes sense to load up on wide receivers and then just try in the middle rounds to scoop up a lot of high upside RB2s. You know, especially it depends on your format, too. I think almost everyone's playing PPR now, but I've seen a few people in standard in, in that case it's probably more of a detriment when you don't get a top pick in a first round standard leagues were probably more of the place where you'd end up seeing people considering that third round reversal kind of deal just because, um, because there's going to be such a much more dramatic fall off. But, you know, I've, you know, I've had leagues where I was down at the bottom and I went wide receiver, wide receiver in the first round uh, and then scooped up some, high upside running backs and you have to play the wire aggressively. You just want to find places where you can get an advantage. You know, if you're, if you know your running back situation is terrible, maybe that's where you, you are the first one to take a, a high QB or a high tight end to try to give yourself a better advantage at that position or to make sure you're killing at a wide receiver. I think there's a lot of ways you can win and focusing too much on just having a, killer running back combination can be a detriment yeah yeah generally i agree with that now i try to get ahead of the tight ends i always for some reason i always want one of those top three tight ends um this year i really targeted Ertz a whole lot i knew i figured people were down farther on Ertz. kittle was up kelsey was up so i said hey let the tight end run start and i'll grab it and get the last of those top three that one kind of bit me a little bit um but the season's not over this year, it's, most of my redrafts are all, all standard scoring, and there were so many running backs available. I ended up doing like three out of the first four rounds. I took running backs, and and one of those other three was one of the elite tight ends. Um, so I don't think that's going to be a thing forever, though. This year, we had a lot of guys that, and it's kind of funny that we're talking about this right after the the third round reversal because of the committees, I was targeting guys like Sony Michelle, Dalvin Cook, um, carry on Johnson. I mean, I was targeting these backfields where I thought there was a clear path to one guy taking the majority of the work. And then I, I, I patched on the wide receivers with Larry Fitzgerald and Tyrell Williams. Um, I've got a lot of Larry Fitzgerald as a result of that as my wide receiver of one or two, which wasn't a great feeling going into the league. 
But now that Larry's doing exactly what I guess he's always done, you know, back end one, top end wide receiver two, um, that feels really good. I don't think I'm going to get away with that very many more years, though. It stung me a couple years, and I feel handicapped by it because I don't have that that wide receiver that I can just play every week and not worry about ever. Um, so I, I do feel like I maybe misstepped a little bit there. Next year, I'll probably – I probably won't take such risk, but being in standard scoring redraft, I thought let's let's focus on these running backs here and get two or three of them that I can start every week. Worst case scenario, I have trade fodder available. Um, next year, I'll probably mix in a few more wide receivers, but I totally agree with you. There's plenty of tight ends to be had late, and if you were on Mark Andrews and you saw it coming, which I didn't, but if you saw Mark Andrews coming, Absolutely right. Take a wide receiver there in the third round instead of Zach Ertz or in the fourth round. And then your team looks so much better than my team. That makes sense. So, yeah, yeah good cat, good call on the Mark Andrews. Yeah, I think for me, well, my thing is so, and I've, I've talked about this before, I pay so much attention to college football. Like, I, I love Saturdays as much as I love Sundays. I, I'm one of those people where – I'm lucky enough that just due to different stuff with my life and, and with my, my wife's work hours, I get a lot of time to, on the weekends to do whatever I want. So I get to spend a lot of time in front of my TV watching games. Uh, and I loved Mark Andrews coming out. I thought he really kind of came on at the end of the year last year. And my biggest thing on Lamar and why I didn't think he'd take a big step forward is that he is extremely accurate when he's throwing pretty close to the line of scrimmage. And he, he he's not as accurate when he goes deep. And so I thought that, that would lean more into too Mark Andrews and we've also seen a couple tight ends every single year kind of come on whether it's just one rookie or or a guy who's been there for a couple years you know we saw Chris Herndon as well last year a lot of guys a lot of people forget that he was a rookie and and he kind of came on strong as well and so that that's just kind of my thing I always try to target some tight end that I think could be a sleeper because you always have those people like you know Hunter Henry for instance Hunter Henry in a lot of drafts I think was drafted as like the fourth or fifth tight end now, granted, if you held on to him, he paid off for you big time last week if you started him, but he hasn't done much of anything. You were talking about Zach Ertz. Zach Ertz has kind of been off to a slow start. So is Kelsey, really. So is Kittle. So that's always my biggest fear with tight end is that you're not going to get – it just seems to change. I, I still think that those top three in, in Kelsey and Kittle and Ertz are going to be up there, but like right now I think the top one is Hooper, which is a guy that Matt bought all into that I don't think anybody was really talking about being a top tight end coming into the year. So it, it's just so – it fluctuates so much more, in my opinion, than any other position uh, is tight end. So that's why I tend to wait on it. Um, I, I like what you said about the way that you kind of took risks there, Tony, because I think that's what, what killed me this year. My biggest thing in redrafts, uh, it killed me in a bunch of them. And, and another one I'm in again with Matt in the FLA, I went really heavy into to running backs later. I, I tried to take one. I got Zeke pretty much in a lot of them. I, I took a risk on him. And most of my drafts, I was drafting between six and nine. And he was falling in every single one of them because at that time, nobody knew what he was going to do. And I took him every time. I was like, I'm taking him. I don't care if he sits out. I didn't think he was going to sit out for the whole season. I was like, I'm going to yeah. take him, and, and I hope he's, he comes back. And it has not really been bad. I mean, again, he's still been a, a good running back. But I think my problem is I went all in on guys later, like Sony Michelle and Darius Geis. And, and I think that's where my problem was, is I knew in my head, I was like, I'm taking risks here on guys who have injuries or are playing on teams that may not be that good, where I should have gone in for a Chris Carson, who we knew was going to get the ball on a run heavy offense, or maybe a carry on Johnson, who hasn't been great, but you know, he's really going to be the guy there. And I think that's probably my problem. Obviously, Matt suffers from this too. I tend to, when I, or not this part, but the players I drafted, I also tend when I'm drafting, I almost always, I don't have the balls to do what you did, Matt. You said that you went like wide receiver heavy in one of yours, went wide receivers round one and two. I always feel like I have to get a running back and wide receiver out of my first two rounds because it's something you said, Tony. I don't want to be going in and playing a guy that I think is going to be, uh, you know, a, a high end two, but that's the guy I have to trust every week where you know he's going to have those bust weeks where you know if you have yeah. in the past a, well, um, Chris Godwin and go, up there who's trying to think of who's been really good so far this season like a Devonte adams before he got hurt for the most part was good i mean a lot of people took him deandre michael thomas is probably the best because he's actually been good all season long so there michael thomas yeah. 
you know, I wanted to take it. I always want to take a guy like that up toward the top that I know I can plug in. I'm having to plug in every week because he's going to get the volume. And the guy I did that for this year was Juju. And that has obviously not worked out for me at all. I know, Matt, you did yeah. the same thing because we've talked about it many times. And, and the guy I took in the third <laughs> round was Stefan Diggs. And that hasn't worked out either. So yeah. maybe I'm just reading too much into my bad drafts this year that have really kind of burned me and trying to figure out different ways to to go forward because I, I just I've found it very hard to kind of go something what you said earlier Tony going RB RB or Matt you said going wide receiver wide receiver I just always feel like mm-hmm. I have to go one or the I have to get one of each in those first two rounds because I want that stud I want that stud running back and stud wide receiver that I can have every single week to kind of build my core around sure and and that well, makes a lot of sense. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, some sometimes your strategy is just not going to pan out. One of the 16-team leagues I'm in, I did wide receiver, wide receiver, in it, and took Juju and Diggs as my first and second pick. And, you know, later took, um, because it was an early draft, later took Andrew Luck as an early quarterback off the board. So sometimes your draft just fails you. Sometimes... You know, you can you luck into things or or make it work. But, you know, I I don't know if you I just I think some some of what we're talking about here with the idea of the third round reversal or some of these other things feel a little bit like panic moves because, you know, we've seen a lot of unsettledness and guys not panning out like we thought. But even top wide receivers that we thought were going to be great haven't been incredible all year. We've talked about DeAndre Hopkins a few times. He's still a great talent. He hasn't put up probably the numbers people thought they were going to get if they took him fifth, sixth, or seventh in the first round, which is where I saw him go quite a few times. All right, well, with all that draft talk, I want to move on to some guys that we drafted that we think could bounce back this year. We've seen a lot of the high-end guys and and big-name players kind of struggle here in this first half of the game. We're about to head into the second half, coming into Week 7 now. Who is the quarterback that you guys think can bounce back? We'll start with Matt and then go to Tony on the quarterback. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, The guy I picked is Jared Goff. Um, and I know what you're thinking. Uh, the guy threw for 78 yards last week. Um, <laughs> and that is really bad. Uh, he's had a couple of lemons early on. Uh, but looking at the Rams schedule, um, they still have incredible wide receiver talent. Hopefully Gurley gets back up and going. You have to figure uh, that their coaching staff is going to make some adjustments and figure some things out. And they have a softer schedule coming up. I mean, this week they're down in Atlanta. And I'm pretty sure that I could throw for 300 yards against the Falcons secondary at this point in time. They get the Cardinals twice in the back half of the season. I think you're going to see him bouncing back up to more where we expected in terms of a level. And I think that will be good for people who have Woods and Cooks and Cup as well. So I took Aaron Rodgers. Um, he's been really disappointing to start. And when I look at the schedule coming up, he, there are some tough matchups coming. 49ers have been a tough defense. They're up in a few weeks. Um, the Bears, they're up against the Bears again soon. The Vikings are coming soon again. Uh, I guess that's in December. But um, against the Lions, that was um, that was a game. I actually picked the Lions to win that game. And at the, it was really looking like it was going to happen that way. And then Aaron Rodgers just kind of came to life again, started doing Aaron Rodgers things. If... If the t- and that was without Devonte Adams, I mean the ki- the guy's got turf toe, and I don't. It doesn't sound like we can talk about this too. Maybe if you guys want to, but I don't know if Devonte Adams is coming back. At least maybe not this month or next month. Uh, that's what put AJ Green on IR last year, and Adams has not sh- shown any signs of being closer to coming onto the field than he was last week. I mean he's just not getting any closer. If if Rodgers can get can get the, the other pieces working with him like he did last week. What was the guy's name? Um, oh, he caught the touchdown late in the game, and then Rodgers targeted him three or four or five, four or five times after that. Uh, what Laz- was his name? Lazard. Lazard, yeah. Yeah, La- yeah, Lazard. I mean, where did he come from? I, I like Aaron Rodgers to pick himself up and move move himself back in the right direction. I think currently he's outside of the top 12 QBs. I just think that's ridiculous. He's an easy bounce back for me just because the talent is so real. 
and and the floor is so low. So yeah, I fully. I'm not saying Aaron Rodgers is going to become the number three QB overnight or anything, but he could easily become serviceable on a weekly basis again. I've got an Aaron Rodgers in uh, in one of the standard leagues. It's actually in one of the standard leagues that um, that I was just referencing before, where I went RB heavy. I actually skipped over a wide receiver because Aaron Rodgers fell. So I'm really waiting on this return of Aaron. If that happens, I feel great about that league. And if I end up with uh, QB five or six on a weekly basis, I'm cool with that. I think that's real. Yeah, uh, Alan Lazard is the original Hakeem Butler. For all those who know that uh, how much I love Hakeem Butler from Iowa State, he's uh, I'm, I'm intrigued to him. I know me and Matt talked a little bit about him earlier this week. I think he could. Uh, Aaron Rodgers talked him up a lot. I think he could be an interesting. Uh, candidate because i agree with you i don't know if Devonte adams is coming back every time he does an interview it sounds like he's getting far farther and farther away from coming right. back and it worries me a lot as someone who owns adams yes let's see for me uh i'm going with josh allen i think he is a guy i had him in my top 12 this year he's sitting right now at qb 20 so i think obviously having a I believe they've already had their bye week. And then on top of that, he did get injured and knocked out of a game. I think that right now he's averaging 23 points a game. I I just, I love this kid. His rushing ability, I know he's not necessarily the most accurate thrower in the world, but his rushing ability alone, I think, gives him a pretty high upside. He's got a very or high ceiling. He has a very easy schedule moving forward, obviously playing in a division that really outside of the Patriots, nobody there scares you. I was trying to get his schedule to pull up here, but my phone is not working. They obviously have the Dolphins this week where I think he could uh, easily put up a ton of points. Then the Eagles, Redskins, Browns, Dolphins again. Broncos is scary. Cowboys is scary. Then the Ravens, Steelers, and then Patriots, Jets. So I think he's got a very easy schedule moving forward for the most part. I think Josh Allen bounces back and, and has a good rest of the year. Tony, we'll start with you. Who do you have at running back as a bounce back candidate? Alvin Kamara. The All Saints right. have their four and zero oh, of the last. Their four of the, four of the last four games have been wins. When did we lose Drew Brees? Was it week three? I think, I think it was week, week three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Against the Rams, yes, week three. Yeah. No way. Yeah, so is that week three or week two? It was week two. Week, week two, two, yeah, because the Browns played the Rams week three, so it was all the way back in week two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it was definitely the Rams that did it. So okay, so for yeah, Teddy Bridgewater looks great. But the problem is, is that the game is different. Right. Uh, Drew, long story short, you don't even need to tell you how Drew how good Drew Brees is. Um, that that team right now is at the top of the division with uh, Drew Brees already throwing the football on the side of the field and stuff. I, he's not officially practicing yet, but I saw something on Twitter a week or two ago about him throwing the ball. Alvin Kamara's due for a huge boost. He's currently also outside of the top twelve, I think, in in um, PPR scoring. I can look that up, but. It's right there on the fringe of RB1s. And I honestly, I think that it's not crazy for me to say that I think Alvin Kamara is a top five RB. So I think that's where he's going to finish. I think that the that Drew Brees coming back into the offense will elevate him back up here. Currently at nine with 109 PPR points, um, RB9. I think that he's got much more to go, go up and Drew Brees is going to help him get there. What about you, Matt? I'm on with Sony Michelle. Um, you know, I think we've seen they've made a concerted effort the last couple of weeks to get him more carries and get him more involved. If you really think about where uh, he kind of took off last year, it was when the weather started turning colder and we got deep in the season, November and December. We've seen historically for the last several years, Tom Brady has a lot more passing and yardage and fantasy points at the beginning of the season than he does toward the end. They tend to toward a move more toward a run heavy attack later in the season when kind of the elements change and, and they're making their run toward the playoffs. And I just think, uh, Michelle is still got the same talent that he had before. It's still the same offense that they were in roughly before we've seen them try to get him going with more touches. I think, He's a guy that, you know, people maybe are giving up on and getting discouraged on a little too early in the season. And once we get toward the back half of November, we're going to start seeing some of those games where he's, you know, carrying the ball 25 times, getting 120 yards, getting a couple of touchdowns. And people are going to remember why they drafted him so high. 
Yeah, I'm kind of surprised neither one of you guys took the layup. I'm taking Saquon Barkley, right? He's got to bounce back sitting as, as RB. No, I'm just kidding. I, I actually was going to go with Sony Michelle as well, uh, mostly because, as I said earlier, I own him in a lot of leagues, so I'm really hoping you're right, Matt, and if not, I'm going to blame you at the end of the season. That didn't work out. What about at wide receiver? Matt, we'll start with you. Who is your bounce back wide receiver? Uh, I went with OBJ. Um, you know, I think we've seen some flashes of good games. I think this bye week is coming at a good time for the Browns. We've talked many, many times throughout here that they have a real tough first half of the schedule, but they have a real nice looking back half of the schedule. I think there'll probably be a few more fallow games when they come back. They obviously have the Patriots, Bills, Broncos, but then you start getting into some easier defenses, uh, you know, Record wise, they might be a place where some of the pressure has, of expectation has come off of them. And I think they're going to keep continuing to improve and grow together. You know, Baker, I think he's not quite gotten to 16 career starts. I mean, we, we think about him being this guy that's out here that's a starter that's, you know, he's still learning and growing. He's been with Odell for, for six games. You know, they have a new coach. They have a, a lot of new dynamics. Uh, you know, we have to give these guys time to make their way. None of these teams really do much in the preseason anymore. So, you know, in a lot of ways, those first few games in September are their preseason. So I, I think the talent's there, the elements are there, um, and hopefully, you know, it's going to lead to a lot more mellow and happy podcasts with you, Matt. Yeah, as the season goes on. I hope so too, buddy. It's really draining me down. Uh, he just hit uh, uh, He just hit 16, at, uh, a full season. I think last week against the 49ers, it was, was his actual first full, technically, if, if you've, you've played a full NFL season with, with last week. So he's, he's moving one game up there with the Seahawks. Uh, and God, I hope you're right, because I own a lot of Baker and Odell. I've just separately, I've owned both of them. Obviously, with Odell coming over, it made me very happy. I, I somewhat, uh, I, I just hope everything you said is right, because as I said, as a Browns fan, it's been a very trying first half of the season, and it has not been as much fun as I had hoped it'd been, even when I was trying to be pessimistic and saying that it wasn't going to be that good. Secretly, I was really telling myself I was being an idiot and we're going to kill everybody, go undefeated, win the like the next five Super Bowls in a row, and then it's not looking like this. we're going to win a Super Bowl in the next 15 years. So, Tony, who did you pick as your bounce-back wide receiver? Well, I wrote down Robbie Anderson, but as I was sitting here looking at it, I'm thinking about Jamison Crowder, and I'm thinking about – that just all that wide receiver group for New York, Sam Darnold really breathed life back into that team. And it was insane to see. I feel like it was a totally different team with Sam Darnold starting last week. Robbie Anderson caught five balls for 125 yards. I think uh, one of them was a huge bomb that ended up in a touchdown. C- catching 62% of his passes from Darnold. I, I really like, I like Darnold to lift that whole offense. I'm going to cheat and say Robbie Anderson and Jamison Crowder because I think that Jamison Crowder will be soaking up enough PPR targets that he'll be instantly um, reliable again, even put him in your RB in your wide receiver two slot. So I'm going to say the jets wide receivers, but if I have to pick one, it's going to be Robbie Anderson. All right. I like that. I was trying to remember who I had on here and it just completely jumped out of my, Oh, Brandon cooks, uh, Brandon cooks, I think is going to be a guy who bounces back some. He's sitting right now at wide receiver 34, uh, averaging 11.6 points, but was actually going really good here. And really these past two weeks of obviously not just him, the entire Rams offense has not been that good. Yet he still put up six points in each of those games, which is still not bad. I think that he's going to bounce back a little bit once this Rams offense kind of finds its footing again. Brandon Cooks, a phenomenal wide receiver, uh, I think is, is, I, I thought he was going to have a better season than Robert Woods. Not really looking like that's going to happen right now, uh, with, with, uh, Robert Woods points, but I like Brandon Cooks to bounce back. Tony, who do you have as your bounce back tight end? Hunter Henry. I'm so glad Hunter Henry's back. He's so much fun to watch. I'm looking at the notes. I'm going to, can I, can I spoil it? Can I spoil your, uh, uh, your pick, Fox? Yeah, I think that's yeah, a that's yes. Yeah. Fun. Cause he's mine too, as well. If, if we're going to, if we're going to spoil it, that was my pick as well. Well, yeah. I mean, I just, I just love Hunter Henry is so exciting. He's so big. He's, 
so good at running routes. He's so good at contested catches. Um, and Philip Rivers missed him, man. There's no way around it. I saw one of the wide receivers got placed on IR the, on IR today. Um, it's wheels up for Hunter Henry. I just hope he can stay healthy. Yeah, I mean, he's been a breakout candidate for probably the last two or three years, and it's just been a real bummer seeing his injuries. And I think – you saw why he's consistently a breakout candidate there in his first game back. People, ah, oh, I don't really want to start him in that great matchup. No, six catches, 100 yards, two touchdowns. I mean, was there any doubt? I mean, there was a little bit doubt. I don't know if you, I didn't know if I thought he was going to do that, but it was good to see him come back and, and do that. All right. With those being all of our bounce back candidates, as I was, I was on the Hunter Henry train as well on tight end. Let's talk about some of the guys who have been really good to start this first half of the season. We think are going to fall off some. I will start at quarterback and I'm going to go with Teflon Tommy. I don't think that the Patriots are going to continue Ooh. throwing the ball and, and doing as much as they have. Really, uh, Tom Brady, uh, he hasn't had that many good games. The past couple weeks, he's got a lot of uh, little, uh, what's a, well, why can't I think of the name right now? QB sneaks in for touchdowns have really kind of boosted his numbers up. I think they have a, a little bit tougher game. They have a pretty decent stretch here against a bunch of good defenses the next six games. I think they're going to be tested a little bit right now. He's sitting at QB 8. I think he's going to drop back down closer to that QB 15, 16 I expected him to be uh, to start or to really to finish out the 2019 season. Matt, who is your QB that you think is going to bounce or fall off in in the second half? Um, I went with Lamar Jackson. Um, I think he's been better than some of us thought he might be to start the season. Um, he's still got, uh, to me, some inflated stats from getting to play uh, the Dolphins and the Cardinals to start the season. Their schedule gets a little bit tougher. Right now, he's quarterback, too. I wouldn't be surprised if he finishes still in the top 10 in quarterbacks, but I don't think you're going to see him. Uh, you know, Right now, there are people like, well, I have Patrick Mahomes, but Lamar Jackson's better. I don't think that's going to be happening as we go deeper into the season. Who you got, Tony? I was going to put down Tom Brady. I didn't. I wasn't brave enough, though. So kudos <laughs> to you for that one. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree with the Tom Brady take. They are going to start running the ball. Um, I put down Gardner Minshew. I feel it, Gardner Minshew was given the job due to an injury. Nick Foles is going to come back. He, Gardner Minshew looked mortal last week, guys. I mean, fourteen of twenty nine, forty eight percent of completions, one hundred and sixty three yards, no touchdowns. I mean. He finally looked mortal again, and unfortunately, he doesn't have a lot to work with. D.D. Westbrook hasn't been exactly, you know, what we were looking for. Now, D.J. Chark, we've talked about him every week, probably we've talked about him. So, of course, there's there are some bright spots on the offense, but I could I see it. To, it's reasonable to me to think that once Nick Foles is healthy, he takes over as the starting quarterback again, and unfortunately, if Minshew's not throwing the ball, he can't score points. All right, well, we'll keep it right there with you, Tony. Who is your running back that you think is going to fall off? Austin Eckler is probably in some trouble for the rest of the season. Yeah. Uh, this week, I still like him. Liked him a lot last week, obviously. But they're going to they're gonna start introducing Gordon into the offense more and more. Unless there's something going on. Unless they made some, Maybe that was part of the deal. Hey, I'll come back, but you can't run the crap out of me. Um, I mean, maybe there was something there that we don't know about, but that seems, that doesn't seem like that happens. I mean, we're, these are football players that are here to play football. So yeah, if you don't want to play football, then don't show up. But it's really clear to me that as Gordon gets more, more ready for, for football workouts, that Eckler is going to be less used. I think he'll be useful throughout the whole year, but right now at RB two or three, that's not real. That's fool's gold. That's going to be gone by the end of the year. Matt, who was your pick? I went with Mark Ingram. Um, you know, I, I think he's been solid, but if you look at where he is, he's pretty high up there uh, among scores, and largely thanks to seven rushing touchdowns in six games. Touchdowns are the most fluky kind of thing. He could maintain the kind of uh, yardage and passing game responsibilities that he had but go on a touchdown drought for three or four games, which wouldn't be a real surprise to anyone. And that would drop his numbers quite a bit. So all those people that picked up Ingram and they just think they have a fringe RB1, I I think you're going to see that come back down to earth. Um, 
uh, I don't think he's going to finish the year with uh, 20 touchdowns. Well, my guy was also someone that I think uh, has has benefited from a lot of touchdowns, and that's Aaron Jones. Right now, he's sitting right up there, I believe right at the top five. He's either at five or six. He's sitting there right now with eight touchdowns on the season. Obviously, the four-touchdown game against the Cowboys really boosted his numbers up. We saw last week when Jamal Williams was back uh, out of concussion protocol and everything, he got a heavy workload, and I do think that's going to continue you go back and look at the first uh, first few games there. Uh, he was getting a lot of run. Uh, Aaron Jones was out there, but it was almost a 50-50 split. Jamal Williams was actually getting more work in the receiving game, which was a little bit surprising because I think Aaron Jones is the better receiver. So he's a guy that I think is going to fall off a little bit. You've got a lot of great run out of him, uh, obviously, w- w- the past couple weeks. Now he's sitting at six, so... Uh, a lot of the past couple weeks with Jamal Williams being out, but I think that's going to come back down to earth a little bit. He's going to fall back out of that top 12. Matt, who do you – did I go with you first? I can't remember who just went. Was it you or Tony that just went on the running backs? Tony. Tony? All right. So then, Matt, who do you have as your fallback wide receiver? Uh, I went with DJ Shark. Um, I I like him, but I think we saw last week uh, because he's emerged a little bit, they're going to start moving – uh, top end coverage guys to him, which is going to be an issue, but he's another guy that had pretty steadily gotten you a touchdown every game. And I just don't think that's, uh, sustainable. Uh, and you know, there's been a, a huge explosion. I think he's still going to be good. Um, you know, a lot of the guys I picked, I don't think they're, they're going to be terrible or, or fall off a cliff. I just think some of the exceptional scoring we've seen in the first few weeks fueled a lot by big touchdown performances is not sustainable over the course of a season. Who did you pick, Tony? I took Keenan Allen here. Okay. Um, Hunter Henry coming back helped a lot. Mike Williams is who we thought he would be. That's good to see. He's definitely starting to take a bigger piece of this uh, this offense. Eckler is available to catch targets, and Melvin Gordon is back. I just... I just feel like Keenan Allen's best games of 2019 happened in week one and two. And it's perfectly reasonable, I think, for me to say that it, just like, uh, just like Fox was just saying, I'm not saying Keenan Allen is, is going to become worthless, but I, I'm moving him down to a wide receiver two at this point with wide receiver one upside. There's just a lot of mouths to feed and there are some other really good receivers in that offense that are going to demand the ball. Keenan Allen deserves double coverage. That's just what it is, which opens up the rest of them. So, yeah, I picked Keenan Allen. I don't hate his guts or anything. I, I want him still. I'm still looking at Keenan Allen in Dynasty Leagues. Uh-huh. But but uh, it's it's something that I'm tempering expectations for for the rest of the year. So I was torn between two players here, but I'm going to go with one guy. I'm wondering if, Matt, could you could you guess who you think I'm about to go with? I'm afraid of who I think you might go with. Amari Pooper, baby. Amari Brickhands Cooper. Uh, sitting right now as wide receiver four. I almost thought about going with Cooper Cup. Cause I don't think he's going to continue doing what he did. But uh, Amari Cooper, I think that the Cowboys offense is realizing now that they're not playing the worst teams in the NFL like they were the first couple weeks. Uh, are not going to be able to throw the ball all over the place, and they're going to go more toward a run-heavy offense with Zeke. I think Michael Gallup is continuing to look better and better every single week, which is going to make him a more bigger weapon in the offense. I think that's going to take some targets away from Amari Cooper. I don't think he falls far, but I do think he falls back out of that top 10 so I can win the many, many bets that I have made that Amari Cooper would not finish as a wide receiver 10 uh, this season. At least that's what I'm hoping. I've got to go all in at this point. And then just keep hoping for the best so I can keep my hair, money, and dignity. All right, let's go on to tight end. Well, that's it. I, I take back all the nice things I said about the Browns. Well, that's just <laughs> not nice. That, that that means more. Okay, I'll take it back. We'll go with Cooper Cup. We'll just pretend like I said all that stuff about the Rams really quick because I need the Browns to win some games. Because that's another way I can keep my hair because I'm losing that as well because of the Browns games are stressing me out. This is one good thing about this week. I know I'm not going to lose any more hair and no more. I'm, none of it's going to turn gray this weekend either because I don't have to watch a Browns game. So I'm, I'm going to be good to go. Uh, Tony, who to, to finish it off here, who is your fall off candidate at tight end? I took Austin Hooper. Um now, a mentor of mine, Garrett Price from the Dynasty Nerds, he was all over Austin Hooper in the offseason. And good job for him. But here's here's what I'm looking at. There's really two games. There's three games that are standing out to me through the six weeks that we've played. 
One of them, Austin Hooper, scored two touchdowns on six receptions. Another one of them, he had 130 receiving yards on nine receptions. And another one was 117. The rest of them have really been pretty pedestrian performances. And Atlanta's really not trending in the right direction. I didn't see this coming out of Atlanta. I thought they were going to be a whole lot better than they are. So, again, this is going to be – I'm saying I'm repeating myself. I hate to say that, but I don't hate Hooper. I still think that Hooper is one of the few tight ends that I would roster and start every week regardless of matchup. But I don't think that this tight end one status is real. There's too many other tight ends who haven't been who haven't been making a splash yet. And a 16-game pace of 1,200 yards is great, but eight touchdowns, that doesn't add up. Those 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 don't add up. So something's not real. Either he's going to score a bajillion touchdowns or he's not going to score or he's not going to have 1,200 receiving yards. I'd say under on the yards and under on the touchdowns. What about you, Matt? Who did you take as your bound or fall off candidate for tight end? Well, first, I think what Tony doesn't know is that Austin Hooper spent the entire offseason collecting blackmail dirt on Dirk Cutter and Matt Ryan. So <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> if anyone falls off, it's going to be that Julio Jones guy. He already got his contract. He doesn't have the blackmail material. <laughs> I feel like these last two uh, discussions have just you know, sent a dagger right through all my fantasy hopes and dreams. Uh, but... Now to dagger somebody else's hopes and dreams, my fall-off tight end is Gerald Everett. And I know you're thinking to yourself, who really likes Gerald Everett? Well, let me tell you, I looked at the scoring today, and he's tight end 11, yeah. which, uh, <laughs> since 12-team leagues are fairly standard, makes him a tight end 1. You couple that with the fact that I've seen three or four people ask for trade advice talking about trading Gerald Everett like he's a hot commodity. And I was thinking to myself, how is that even possible? Um, and then I looked at the scoring. Well, I think the Rams are going to bounce back, but I think that's going to be good news for people who own Cooks and Cup and Robert Woods. I don't think it's going to be great news for Everett. He's had a couple of big performances, but he's not even the only tight end target on his own team. This would be like betting on Cameron Brait being a tight end one for the season, knowing O.J. Howard is out there. Ty- Tyler Higby plays tight end for the Rams. He just got a huge contract. He was actually the one that got peppered with targets and a touchdown the first week with uh, Jared Goff. I just think if you scooped up Everett and you think that he's the second coming of a tight end one, you're going to be in for some rough times. Yeah, so I went uh, with someone who who's right there with him, and that's Delaney Walker. Now, maybe that'll change with Ryan Tannehill being moved into the quarterback position. We, we've seen that he really likes to kind of target that part of the field and the slot wide receiver uh, and the tight end. So maybe I will be completely wrong on this, but he has really done nothing outside of that week one game against the Browns where he scored the two touchdowns with 22 points, uh, has not uh, only broken double digits once since then, one, two, and seven points here recently. Uh, so I think Delaney Walker is due for a fall off. There's a bunch of guys right there I think could. Um, Jason Witten, Greg Olson, I think uh, um, obviously Will Disley, but that, that's not really fair to say because it's because he's injured, obviously. So that was my pick in Delaney Walker. Uh, Matt, Tony, thank you guys so much for joining me today and having this uh, interesting little draft strategy discussions and, and everything else, bounce back, fall off candidates. I uh, hope you guys uh, win your fantasy matchups this weekend and both of your teams pull out wins because I know how miserable a weekend can be when it doesn't happen for you. So both of you guys enjoy your weekends and I look forward to talking to you guys next week. Thanks for having us. Bye. Sounds good. Prepare for glory. Touchdown! I would be honored if you played football for this team. Throw it up above his head.